Hi, everyone. Welcome to Artists United. Welcome to today's panel discussion on business impacts on the arts and artists during this crazy time right now. We're so glad you're here to join us. Uh, my name, again, is Janice De Lucia. I am an actor and a filmmaker, and I sit on the executive committee of Artists United. And I'm here to welcome you to our event and I would like to introduce you to our moderator and our guest panelists. Um, that's me. And I believe you can also see me here on the side in the panel, hopefully. Um, I'd like to start by introducing you to Sam Hull. Sam Hull also sits on the board of Artists United. He's a director, teacher, designer, creative consultant, acting coach, and performer. Um, he's worked both on stage and film. He's won numerous design awards. And currently, Sam is the founder of an organization called Artemists. And he's built his career on producing, directing, and reinventing artistic opportunities for women. Sam, would you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing now. Sam, I believe you are on mute. Try it again. Sam there is we not go. technically. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam is not technically advanced. Um, uh, yeah, so as Jenna said, I uh, founded Artemis Arts, um, which is a national nonprofit for women in the arts. Um, we are, our mission statement is the advancement of the woman artist through knowledge building, exposure and support. So with um, COVID going on, my daily tasks are helping women across the, the nation at this point. Um, the only thing I would add as an intro is I always like the, the secret things that people do or the things we don't expect. And so I would just say that I'm also an international bowling champion. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, I'm going to take a moment to introduce an artist that we hope will be joining us later on in the discussion. Um, Bruce Sunpai Barnes. He is an athlete, musician, cultural ambassador from the great city of New Orleans. We are so hoping he can join us. Um, Barnes plays seven instruments and he is a consummate, consummate professional musician. Um, so we're hoping to see Sun Pai very shortly. I hope it's all right that I call him Sun Pai, not knowing him very well. Um, next, I would like to introduce to you Celia Finkelstein. Celia is an actress and writer. She has recently uh, sold a pilot and, it, and is in development with TriStar. The name of the pilot is Kink. Um, she has numerous credits on IMDb, among which a uh, regular recurring role in American Horror Story. Um, I would like to say that the first thing I felt from Celia when I read about her and when I saw videos of her, she has an incredibly ebullient spirit. Celia, would you tell us a little bit about the work you're doing? Hi, uh, I'm Celia. I'm, uh, I'm an actor and writer, primarily writing. Um, writing sort of taken over in the last few years, um, but I do both and have been acting in my bathroom for a little while during the quarantine <laughs> time to try and get my yagas out. Um, uh, that's about it. That's Welcome. We're yeah. so glad Thank to you. have you. Thanks for having me. Next, I'd like to introduce Steve, Stephen Karras. Stephen, am I, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? You are. Very good. Um, Stephen is a dancer and photographer. He's got this beautiful merger of uh, artistic abilities. He worked with the great Balanchine, for a, an extended period of time. Stephen has, just from getting to know him briefly before this uh, panel, has a sweet, warm, lovely spirit, a fantastic aesthetic in his photography. Um, there is an Emmy award-winning documentary about his work in both spheres, photography and dance, and the transition between the two. Um, Stephen, would you tell us a little bit about the work that you do? Well, you know, when you listen to your inner voice and you follow that sort of heart inspired uh, direction, you don't screw up. So yeah. it took me 15 years to take my first ballet class. And when I did three years later, lucky for me, George Balanchine invited me to join his company. And from there, 
every chapter ever since has been inspired by my making sure that fear would never get in my way ever again, because boys did not do that in those days, not in my neighborhood and zip code in New Jersey in those days. So ever since then, my photography, my uh, development work, my public speaking, my teaching, ballet mastering, and all of the all of the subsequent things that I've done have been inspired by that tiny little uh, weak in the beginning voice saying, uh, "Listen to me and 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 go forward." So beautiful. Thanks for having me here. That's absolutely beautiful, Stephen. And actually, what you just said is so relevant to what we're all going through right now. Thank you so much. Um, next, let's move on to Jen Grinnells. Jen Grinnells is a musician and an actress. Um, she has an incredibly beautiful voice, a powerful singing style. Um, I want to let everybody know that I was listening to, she has an album coming out very shortly called Go Mine. It's being released on May 8th. I was able to listen to the track, Please Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood Today. I listened to it about five times. I was so charmed by it. Um, Jen, would you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? Um, sure. I'm a uh, longtime touring singer-songwriter for about the last 10 years. So right now I'm really focused on just promotion of the music that I've made in the last year. Um, so the new album that's coming out and then also a new project with a friend that's a uh, folk Americana album. So, And that's the project you're talking about with Meredith Clark? Mm -hmm. Very good. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. There was, uh, there's a Dolly Parton connection there I wanna talk about later on. Um, and I believe, Rudy, is that you? Rudy, hi. Hello, everybody. So nice to meet you, Rudy. Uh, Rudy, and please uh, help me make sure I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Is it Langley? Langless. Langless, thank you. Um, we now have Rudy Langless joining us. Rudy is a film producer and a former journalist. Um, in his film production, he has worked with Wesley Snipes, Gregory Hines, Jamie Foxx, Jim Belushi. Um, the thing that really struck me, Rudy, about your work um, is that you have produced films or at least a film that I noted that resulted from your own journalistic investigations. I thought that was absolutely wonderful and fascinating. Um, would you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? Next uh, up for us is a film we're doing about Miles Davis, a jazz musician that uh, Denzel Washington is directing. Fantastic. And uh, then we're doing a film uh, about uh, the, uh, the man who discovered Bob Marley and their relationship. The man who discovered Bob Marley actually was a big time gangster in the largest mob family in the world. <laughs> and so it's about how the mob essentially financed Bob Marley and developed his uh, his career. So those are. The oh my gosh, I'm not. I don't have a poker face, as many of you can tell right now, because <laughs> that's wonderful. I did want to note also because one of the things that also struck me is that you were formerly a city editor of the Village Voice, executive editor of editor of Spin Magazine, and it seems like you've done a phenomenal job of merging these worlds. Um, yes, so that's our, that's our cast for today. And I'd like to hand this conversation over to Sam now, um, and we're gonna start, start our discussion. Absolutely, um, thanks Janice. Just so everybody understands how we're gonna do, I'm gonna pose some questions to our panel and give them each uh, opportunity to answer it. And they may just have a conversation amongst themselves or um, I may um, step in and ask them to um, explain things further. So we're just gonna talk so that there's information out there and so that you can get a sense of what other people are doing during this time. So let's start with um, the first question, um, Celia. What does your personal creativity look like or feel like right now? Um, that's a, an almost hour to hour uh, thing. Uh, there's a different answer for every hour. I think um, some days I'm feeling really creative and really wanting to work. Some days I just need to sit in front of my television and cry a little. Um, 
it took me about two weeks into this to be okay with one or the other. Um, I spent about uh, two weeks sort of beating myself up for not being able to produce something or stick to my normal writing schedule or working schedule and um, finally forgiven myself for that. So I write when I feel good about it and it feels like an escape and I feel like I'm um, doing it from a place of openness and readiness and when I'm not when I'm not in that place I find something else to do. And are you used to writing at home or did, before this did you have an office to go to or a team to work with? Uh, no I usually write at home or in some sort of um, like shared workspace um, sometimes a cafe uh, but um, no I'm I tend to write at home mostly so this wasn't that much of, of a shift in terms of my actual day-to-day. -day. It's more about the mindset and the way my brain is operating. Gotcha, thank you. <laughs> Jen, same question. I, uh, I think the honest answer is that it's, I feel really productive right now <laughs> um, because the, you know, the atmosphere and, and the circumstances have stopped on my touring. Um, so it's just forcing that, like sitting home all day and what can I do? Um, and I found I've put quite a butt groove in my couch, just like sitting and writing and um, promoting the stuff that I've worked on. And the first few weeks, it was almost like uh, nothing was different just because of where I was, you know, phasing, like you, you make music, you promote music, and then you tour music. So I think it'll be hard next month when I, I should have been going on tours and I will feel that. Um, but I, I actually feel like I've been able to, to take advantage of the stillness and not moving and, and, you know, be as productive as possible. Yeah. So as an artist with, especially with the two projects you have coming up next month, is this, is this time and this sitting giving you like an opportunity you usually don't have to really sit and think about the launch of both of them in a different way? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's really like focused and streamlined. There's not, you know, ticket sales to worry about and routing to worry about and all of that stuff. It's been really like, okay, here are two things. How can I get these out to the world? And I think that uh, I haven't been able to be as creative. I've done some sort of like uh, writing and um, production recording and stuff like that. That's been a smaller percentage than I would like it to be, but it's also time to sit and focus on that stuff. So, um, so far it's been okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so Rudy, how about you? So what does my day look like? Well, what's your, your, your personal creativity look or feel like right now? It looks like every day. It looks like actually what it looks like in a, uh, in a normal if you can call what we do normal, it looks like every day. So for me, that means long hours on the phone with writers, with directors, with, you know, now that the studios have, you know, set up again off campus and the agents the same, you know, my days are spent on the phones with agents, with managers, with, with writers. Uh, the only part that has created some distance is I like to work long hours with writers if we're working on something or with directors if we're shaping something. And so having to move what should be some very intimate kinds of working arrangements into the into a Zoom call, you know, is it robs me of some of the pleasure that I take in how we go about creating things. But, um, but for the most part, it's been, every day is like it has been. The only part, if there's a binary part about this, it's that the other part of what I do, I consider producing creative work as well. You know, how you, how you create a production to me is as creative as how you write a screenplay or how a director directs the film. I consider myself very often the auteur of, the work that I am doing because I originated most of the projects that I'm doing. So, so, so that, that creative part 
is stymied to an extent because you know much of the day on the production side is figuring out how are we going to get back into production when are we going to get back into production and there's a lot of creative ideas that are going around now about how can production begin again and and so i'm engaged in those with insurance companies and bond companies figuring out you know there's some very clever um, things that are that are being considered you know for example the, the one of my associates has now engaged with one of the the leading virologists who was on the front lines of the Ebola crisis and had created a team and that team had um, uh, gone into Africa and set up cleanly circumstances in hospitals and in villages. Well, those same principles are now being being looked at as being applicable to how a production can move forward. How do you create a, 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 a virus-free environment on a film set or within a film production? And so a lot is going to be heard about that sort of thing. So that's the, that's the other half of my brain is the production side, figuring creatively, how are we going to get things back into production without having to be down that long. And producing is completely problem solving. So oh, yeah. is, yeah. I'm fascinated to hear that this is a, even, that the, I was wondering what was going to happen with film production. So forgive me for interrupting, but that's a fascinating topic to me. How, how are we going to go into production? Yeah, there's some interesting things to keep an eye on. There's an Australian soap opera that's in production that's employing some very some very novel strategies where you know they have created small small crews within the company for shooting you know scenes and no no big scenes smaller scenes and each crew is its own pod so in the event and they constantly are checking to see you know your temperature are you showing any signs and then if any anything appears in one crew they can isolate that crew but it allows for the others to continue their their production process so some very some very clever and that's a that's a going production that production is actually ongoing so yeah. excellent well thank you um steven how about you how are you uh dealing with your personal creativity well it, it's been peaceful all of my gigs have come to a screeching halt. So um, I've switched gears and now I'm back to writing with uh, fewer preoccupations, right? Ever since the documentary uh, that aired about me on PBS, um, people have been writing to me and asking me um, if I would reveal more in depth about my experiences growing up. Etc. So what seems to be evolving from this period when I have no excuse not to go back to that uh, writing is um, a sort of how to overcome fear guide from the perspective of one who has spent uh, a good portion of his life trying to overcome it. So I've been working on, I don't know if it's a book, I don't, I don't know why, it seems like it, it might be a book, but it has given me the excuse to, um, to reflect on, on that and do something about it and get back to it. So um, luckily um, it was a life and remains a life that was blessed as was mentioned by Janice in the introduction with George Balanchine as my mentor, first as a dancer, later simultaneously as a dancer and a photographer. And ironically, all of you and everyone who's listening, Mr. Balanchine passed away today, 37 years ago. Mm -hmm. The 14 years I spent in the New York City Ballet as a dancer were the first 14 years of my life, in essence, and the last of his. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, so I, I'm trying to help others with, with what I have uh, overcome in all of the chapters of my reinventions of myself in writing. So these um, cancellations of all gigs of mine 
has been sort of a blessing if if you kind of get what I'm saying. Yeah, so it's it's interesting um, to hear you all speak because I think a lot of times with younger artists or or people who are um, just introducing their mediums, sometimes they get frustrated and and feel like they can't work. But all of you have found some way to do work, um, so you all are finding that outlet. You're finding that inspiration somehow to do something. Whether it's like Stephen said, like he's switching to something different. It sounds like you all are finding a way to have a path. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing that I was hearing, Sam, and again, forgive me for interrupting, but the other thing that I was hearing was there are phases. Everybody was talking about phases, like things are going well now, and then there's maybe a little shift down in energy. And I, and it seems like everybody, you know, and I'm seeing nodding heads. So does anybody want to speak to finding that patience? Is it, pa is the word patience? What is it? Oh, well, in my case, um, I've been around a long time. So, and I think about young people now, um, and I um, remember how time dragged when I was Jen's age, you know, and um, younger. And um, the day I recognized uh, how valuable time was, was the day the gun went off and the chase started. And I've been chasing that as many of us in my generation have ever since. So I, I think that it's very important for young people now as, as, as um, maybe overly energetic as they might be, is to reflect on uh, themselves and take this as a blessing in disguise and look at what they've done so far listen to that inner voice, as I said earlier. Um, so, you know. Yeah, so it's like a, like a like an inventory. It's like, sounds like um, myself included. Like I have these moments in the day where I just have to sit and take an inventory, you know? And for me, it's like I go into the bathroom, rip a little bit more wallpaper out of the bathroom, think about something, like, oh, and then go back and do what I'm doing. But is, are you all experiencing that inventory phase as well throughout the day or a week? Well, you know, I, I think inventory for me is that um, I um, I got away from something that had had grounded me, which was my yoga practice, and because things had had become so busy before the lockdown, and I was traveling a lot, and I was in China actually just before the the virus um, broke for the first time here, and and that pace took me away from my yoga practice. And I finally found time in the, in the quiet, those silences now where, you know, there may be a day where everything is quiet and how do you navigate through that, that day? And it took me back and I realized that the reason why my yoga practice had become such an important part of my life is that it actually had, had helped me rewire my ego and you know if, if you know i think a producer his greatest weapon and tool is his ego is a kind of a certainty about about what what you're doing and the certainty that you know you're going to command a group of people to do a certain thing and deliver it a certain way but your ego can get bent out of shape with that kind of of authority and i found that finally i went back to to my my practice, I had I had the time some days, and I went back to it, and I found again that balance that I had lost in some ways in in the energetic pace. So I I, I found a way to to be silent again, and use the silence to reconnect to something um, bigger than myself. Therefore, checking my ego. Yeah. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to ask a quick question of Celia. Celia, earlier you talked about needing to stop and start and shift gears, and I just wanted to find out from you, how, do you, how are you finding the ability to know what to do when, in other words? Because we're in a very boundaryless time, if that's even a word. <laughs> sure. Yes, uh, I, I think, um, you know, it's just, I... I, I have a meditation practice similar to Rudy. I have a meditation practice that's really helpful for me. 
Um, it helps me when I start my day with meditation to listen to myself and really settle into what is, what am I feeling? What is the, what, what am I ready for today? Um, I think for me, uh, you know, this has been, um, personally affecting what we, my family lost a family member. So there has been a, um, a, 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 an element of I'm, I'm trying to balance work with the emotional part of it as well. So I just try to have, someone mentioned patience earlier. I just try to have patience with myself um, and really listen to what I'm, uh, what I'm feeling and what I'm ready for that day. And, and, and if I'm, like I said, if I'm prepared to work, then I'm prepared to work. And I, and I find myself doing that for long stretches. I'm, much to my fiance's chagrin, I'll sit for about 12 hours and write and not stop or talk or do anything. Um, and then some days I, I don't want to, and I want to just uh, go for a walk or, or watch, um, you know, uh, plot against America is what we finished in two days this week. Um, but so I, I, I think for me, it's, it's just about listening to myself and sticking with that, pra that meditation practice so I can really be present with my own. Mm voice mm -hmm. yeah and Jen so taking that and, and moving to the next uh, question here how how are you working with collaboration with Meredith K Clark right now if you guys have a project you're working on how is collaboration changing and all of, I'll ask all of you to answer this but how does collaboration work now um well I I think there's there's actually I because of the, I think quarantine really agrees with me actually. <laughs> like, <laughs> I also like to sit for 12 hours and not move and focus on something. And um, so the focus has become everything that we can do online, everything we can do digitally. Um, and luckily there are more eyeballs on computers. Um, so Meredith and I have, I mean, even just yesterday, you know, I recorded some tracks, I emailed them to her. She recorded the vocals in her house, emailed them back to me. I sat and mixed for five hours. You know, it's like, um, there's still so much we can do in that way. Um, so it's not as much fun. Like, you know, it does, it's much more fun in person, but um, but you can still do it and it still feels creative and it still feels good. And it it's also just nice that I think we can reach more people with that stuff right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So part, of, so part of it sounds like you have to give in to what the process is and not judge it or get stuck on that it's not the normal process, but it is a process that works right now and you're finding the workaround. Great. Yeah. Stephen, how's your cl collaborations going with folks? Well, you know, I'm, I'm always collaborating. That's just something I've always been a part of, but I, I see artists, in, in, referring to your question, um, locally, but also globally, more readily reaching out to one another, to each other, to ourselves, and personally, which is a relief. You know, if you're competing, and I hate that word, you know, it's a four-letter word sometimes, uh, other than, you know, our friend here who's who's been part of the NFL, you know, there's competition in sports, but there, there's healthy competition, and that, that, that's part of it. Um, uh, the fact that, let's say, for example, photographers have reached out to me and I've reached out to others and comparing life experiences because we can't get out there and shoot the things that we have normally been shooting live performances, <clears throat> individuals, etc. And dropping that competitive aspect because everyone is kind of wanting the same gig. And when I, when I recognized that as a dancer in the New York City Ballet and uh, had this love of trying to record it simply because I couldn't believe that I was a part of this world and Balanchine took note and further mentored me now as a photographer, um, I realized that, that it was a very, uh, once I transitioned and became a photographer. And when he passed away, I left the company. It was the, as lonely as performing in a group was not. I was part of 70, 80 dancers performing for 3000 people nightly. Suddenly I'm in a dark corner 
by myself, trying not to be heard or seen, and then in the dark room, and then editing. And I understand that other photographers go through this as well. So when we're all reaching out to each other and comparing, I don't want to say <laughs> miseries, but um, you know our, you know our setbacks or our, you know, our challenges, I should say, you know, it's kind of great dropping the competitive state. And also in this time, I've noticed that other artists like photographers and everyone else in the fields we're all in here in this committee and beyond um, are taking an important look at the work they've done because we are rather sequestered and um, be, becoming proud thankfully and finally of what they've produced and in in turn exposing many many more of us to the work that we hadn't seen yet so the fact that we're um, exploring each other for whatever reason whether it's you know cabin fever or whatever I think is is pretty incredible. We're, we're coming together in, as opposed to feeling um, uh, alienated with regard to that awful four letter word competition in, in the wrong sense of it. And Rudy? I can, I can just imagine Rudy having directed feature films that you've got to find a way to work with the line producers because they're so out of their element with all this like What's that collaboration look like? You said you're on the phone all the time. So how is that changing? Well, I, th I, I think it, um, you know, the technology is really redefining collaboration and, and it, it is expanding the, the possibilities. You know, we, we already were living in a Skype world. We were already living in um, uh, even in post-production, not being in the same place as where the editing room is and having things shipped, you know, through pipes and lines, you know, to, to different locations. So, so I think we, we, apart from just the physical work of it and being present on a set, you know, we were already transitioning into the, into the world that we now, that we now live in. So, I think we were prepared, and you know the producers I work with, and and even the writers that that and directors that I work with, we, we already were transitioning into this into this reality. So the the shift to um, uh, a purely technological way of communicating, still the phone, but you know now now Zoom in particular has become a, a very important tool. You know it's possible. You know, whereas a three-hour phone call on a script can wear wear everybody's uh, nerves down, a three-hour Zoom uh, call actually comes closest to replicating, you know, a working relationship uh, in a room. So those things, those things actually have have maybe to a certain extent um um extended some a direction we were already going in i i imagine that when all this is over um it will it will it will continue to be the way that that collaboration actually happens um uh, more and particularly if you're working you know i have partners in china who who i i work with and partners in new zealand and toronto and various other places you know i i wouldn't see them unless you know, we, we, we communicated by Skype. So there was more of that. I find that there's a lot more of people's willingness to say, let's have a Zoom or Skype meeting as opposed to let's have a phone conference. And, you know, that brings back some of the intimacy. I think that the creative process really thrives on, but, um, uh, uh, you know, it has now made it you know, are, are more of our normal than it was even before the quarantining happened. Okay. So um, looking at where you're at in your own communities right now, what, what are you guys, because we're across the, the U.S. here, this panel, we, we span the U.S. Um, what's going on where you're at? What's some things that we might not see on the news that's happening or that you're seeing as far as creative groups in your, your area or um, um, 
interesting things happening locally for you guys. It's uh, a good question. Yeah, um, it's hard to say. I don't know. I don't know how to how to say that. I'm not sure that. Um, or is that, or is that one of the things right now that's kind of falling by the wayside? Like I, I, I've had conversations through through Artemis um, with some of the theater um, companies here in town. Um, I'm in Portland, Oregon, um, and they really, you know, with the the regulations coming out and the suggestions, like how do you open up a live theater and have an audience and and make it not even profitable, but make enough money to keep the lights on if you open the doors because you can't sell every seat anymore. Um, and you have to be more um, astute to the lobby space and the bathroom space and the things like that. And so I know up here in the Pacific Northwest, um, we have the pact with uh, Washington State, Oregon, and California where we're all going to open together. And I believe Colorado and Nevada joined that group. And so it's it's like we have a, almost our, our many little community out here trying to figure that out but in Portland it seems that um the chats we have um like pdx backstage we have these little rooms um and chats for people and it seems like people are really on there trying to offer suggestions and 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 help with what they can and I know that SAG and SAG AFTRA and Actors Equity TCG I know all those people are putting out stuff so is there things that you guys can share that you might know about there that other folks might not know about in your area well, with regard to the, your collaboration question mm -hmm. and, and how that fits into our personal work right now and what we think we can offer as individuals and artists, um, my archive, uh, my photographic archive is, has over 120,000 <laughs> photographs. So yeah, I've been at it for a long time. So I allow anybody that wants to use them for whatever mission they have, because they say a, a picture speaks a thousand words. I allow institutions, organizations, not just dance companies, but to utilize them for their efforts going forward. Brainstorming with other arts organizations is, is extremely important now, and we don't have any excuse to run away for it, from it. We all have to agree that, you know, this is a country that doesn't uh, governmentally support the arts. You know, we're on our own. So when a dance company, for instance, is, you know, it, it takes, let's say you sell every, every ticket to every performance in the course of a season, I'm talking New York City Ballet, Miami City Ballet or Ballet Palm Beach, a small you know, company in, in West Palm Beach. Um, that's about 60 or 70, if you're lucky, percent of the annual operating budget. So how do we ask for support when these wonderful frontline people are risking their lives you know, for, for what we're trying to get through and live through at this point. It's a challenge and it's a great question. Um, with regard to this Ballet Palm Beach, uh, which is located down here in where I live, um, they, they've they been dancing all over the world from Croatia to Russia to Cuba to the South Bronx at their own expense in nursing homes and in, in uh, prisons and town squares to um, inspire those who were less fortunate, not able to buy a ticket to see anything. There's validity in that. So these are the discussions that are going on. How do, we, how, does, how do they ask for money at a time or support? Money is the word you jump to, but you know, support uh, at a time when all of this is, is going on. Uh, it's, it's challenging. So here we have the time now because we're not out doing what we do. Uh, to brainstorm about this and come up with uh, creative solutions, or at least venues to 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 uh, try and take. You know, one of the one of the you 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 you, um, you just triggered uh, thought. One of the things you know, and this this question about how is the theater going to going to. Um, um, recover how or how can theater be presented or how can any live performance or event a concert um, of any kind and what I what 
has most been intriguing to me in the last week is that uh, several of the major um, promotional touring um, companies, Live Nation, among them Rock Nation, have been collaborating with, with a partner of mine in a way of reinventing the live experience. How do, you, how do you reinvent and recreate the live experience? Because the feeling is that the live experience, particularly in the concert world, and I imagine this applies in the theater world too, is not coming back for some time. That people are not going back to the theater comfortably or easily. The idea of seat spacing, that's not, that's not going to work. That's not profitable. It's also not the theater experience at all, which is about being in a, in a collective, in a community of people enjoying. So what, what then allows for an audience to experience a theatrical uh, event without having to be in a crowd of people? And there's some really inventive ideas that are being developed through technology that allow for um, you you know, consider the principle of us having this conversation now. Imagine that this were a, a live event for for us to 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 experience that live event almost in a virtual reality context, but be able to act to be act as if we're within a group. You may go to the theater with four or five of your friends. You know, you may have conversations before, after, but to what to recreate that live experience. Uh, with a live event, the event itself will be live. The audience the ability to 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 um, have, you know, um, uh, thousands of people at that event in various groups to be aware that there are a thousand, two thousand other people who are at the same event. I think there are some very exciting kinds of experimentation going on, and it makes sense that companies like Live Nation, who you know, that's their lifeblood are exploring ways to to make that that experience as 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 vivid as if you were actually in the theater because i think there's going to have to be that kind of you know i have an expression don't don't think out of the box or think in the box think without the box and i think there is without the box thinking going on about what the live experience is going to be like after this and and i think we'll see a reinvention of certain live experience, not all, but certain live experience. Yeah, so Jen, that totally affects what you do. So have you been catching yourself <laughs> thinking about this? Oh yeah, uh, not just um, thinking about it, but doing. So once my, you know, I have obviously uh, various income streams and once concerts got cut and I have some, I think right now July is, there's still some optimistic venues that are like maybe July, but I mean, everything keeps getting pushed further and further out. Um, so I have a focus now on, um, on three, three income streams. And one of those is uh, online concerts. And I was already doing online concerts and have been for years. Um, and then when this happened, it was like, uh, suddenly, so I do it usually through a, a, vent, a platform called Stage It and stage it tries to make some of that live experience um, happen. You, you pick a certain number of tickets so your shows can sell out. They don't record the shows, so it's only live. They have um, a chat room next to your screen so you can see people interacting. And um, they even have like a, a way to monetize it. Like, you know, I set a ticket price, but then people can <laughs> tip you as yep. you are performing and you see the tips go up the chat and it's, it's fun. And um, so, but the one thing I have developed as, it was really weird. It was like, I was already doing this and then kind of the, you know, the day that it came down, like, okay, everyone shelter in place. Um, I got mentioned in some music article, like, this is what she does. And I was like, I was already doing that, but okay, yes. And so it just kind of, the exposure was great. And then the show started selling out and um, selling out because, you know, I suppose you have control over that. But um, one thing I did was I, I have, a, I own lighting because I care about lighting. So I actually, you know, create a backdrop and I have lighting and I have my um, mics set up and going directly into the computer so I can make a really great professional sounding mix because 
that's the one thing I don't love about the live stream experience is the quality of sound and um, mm. the setting and, and stuff like that. So I've really worked hard to try to make these concerts you know, the best thing that I can. And even though it will never replace touring and, and the live experience, um, there are definitely advantages. Like I, obviously the selling way more tickets, way more eyeball, eyeballs, people being open to stage it and, and live concerts. Um, but there's also this, the great thing is, you know, it's, it's amazing to call out like, where are you watching from? And you see it go up in the chat room and people are watching from all over the world. And I always like to say at the end, I will try to run down the screen names of every single person watching and just like, I see you, I can, I connect, I thank you for being here. And, um, and people can call out, you know, covers or like song requests. Um, so that's been, uh, it hasn't replaced the, you know, concert touring revenue completely, but um, it's been, I'm just really grateful for the option and that it's, that a lot of people have the time to <laughs> watch right now. Um, and, and that also the support, because one of the things I talk about with my musician friends is like, everybody's doing that on Facebook. Like, what do you do when Sting is going from his living room at the same time? And, you know, it's kind of that competition thing, but so far I've just found that the audience is there for me and, and it's been really nice. Yeah. And Celia, are, do you think, um, I know there's always been a, a big push, especially the last probably nine months for self-taped auditions. Do you think that's going to become a thing there in LA, like where people are just going to have to learn how to do it and figure out a system for that? I mean, it's been pretty consistently the thing for the last year or so. I, I can count on, I can probably count on two hands the number of times I've actually been in an office in the last couple of years. Um, and not just because I have an audition frequently. I, it's, it is almost replaced in many ways being in, mm. being in front of a producer. So, and I know uh, at least a few people who have been self-taping even during this time, people are still casting with the anticipation that we'll go back. Um, so I think, yes, it will continue to become the thing, continue to be the thing. I think it will probably um, for better or worse become the, the consistent practice the new norm yeah okay yeah. so as we start to wrap things up um, one of the things with um, artists united we like to do is um, the mission statement for the organization really supports artists being able to ask for assistance that they need and then offer anything that they have for other people so is there each of you something that you specifically need help with right now i know jen has some projects go ahead jen Tell us what you're doing and, and where you need people to go click. You're on mute, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned that, you know, I because I've had this shift from performing live that I have now these these three things that I can still do that I focus on. And so online concerts is the one thing. But the thing that I think I can offer some help with is that I use a platform called Patreon. And it has been my life raft through this time. Um, because it's all online and it's just about finding the people that support your creative process. So I, um, I write two to three times a month and put it out because um, I get financial support every time I do that. So it's kept me afloat, it's kept the lights on and it also really incentivizes me to be creative and be busy. And it also keeps my day going because I have these deadlines coming up um, and I've been doing it for probably three or four years. So I just have a lot of insight into how to make it work and, and um, make it work for you. And it can be with all sorts of mediums. It doesn't have to be music. Um, there's photographers on there and there's filmmakers and there's writers and artists of all kinds. So it's been a lifesaver for sure. So that's what I can offer. So if anyone has any questions on how to use it. Um, and then what I, need is um, support for this Kickstarter that launches in nine minutes, um, which is my third um, kind of income stream. And it's the big question mark because um, this Kickstarter has always been planned for this upcoming album. The timing is terrible. And I just feel like it's a really hard time to navigate um, asking people to support your art in that way. 
Um, so we're trying to be sensitive to that. Um, but this is our job. So we still kind of have to go forth and, and do what we were planning to do and make the art that we want to make. So, um, okay. yeah. Great, thanks, Celia. What, what do you need? You know, I don't have any Im immediate needs at the moment. I think I'm, um, I'm I, I've been able to uh, sort of, thank goodness, meet, have my needs met at the moment. Um, uh, in terms of an offer, I don't know. It's hard to, to know what to offer in this time that I can help with or be of assistance with from afar. But um, I am a, I'm, I'm really good at notes. And so I would say to the writers out there that if you are struggling and you, uh, if you want some thoughts or feedback or to bounce something off of someone, you can contact Artemis and they'll pass it along to me and we can maybe make a contact and talk. Thank you, Stephen. I think it's a really hard time for writers, so. Hey, I just, Sam and Janice, with regard to that question, what adaptations have you made in your process? <clears throat> Well, attending live performances, shooting dance, giving lectures and teaching dance is all gone. So I attend performances online by all of the above included here and beyond. And I encourage that. Shooting dance, no, but I, I share my, my photography, 120,000 plus images with whoever needs them. It doesn't have to be a dance company or a dance institution uh, to utilize for their uh, usage, however they need. My lectures and more um, lovingly my interviews with the likes of Dr. Ruth and Michael Feinstein and Wendy Whalen of New York City Valley, Iris Apfel, are not happening, but they've happened luckily, so they're going to be streamed by the art centers that have produced them, so people will get to know these wonderful people those who did not get to attend that one day thing and teaching ballet classes, which I love. It's probably my favorite part of my life, to be fully honest. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm loving watching these great teachers all over the planet. Instead of getting online at my kitchen counter and getting in the plies and doing the extensions and such at this tender age, uh, instead um, I'm, a, deferring to these new members of our community and learning plenty from them in the process because if you think you know everything while you're still down here on the planet, you're fooling yourself. So I, I'm loving what I'm not doing because it's offered <laughs> all these great opportunities to see all these other options. Um, what I need, nothing. What I love, is uh, being available for anyone to contact me for whatever their needs are. And if I can help, I'm all, I'm all for it. Yeah, and Stephen, before we let you go, what's the name of the um, documentary about you? It's, it's called Stephen Karras, See Them Dance. Okay. It um, aired for three years on PBS. It won the filmmakers an Emmy and other awards for them, kudos. And it's on my website, stephencarras.com. Um, and it's going to be further circulated as a result of this quarantine, which is, as we have all uh, shared, extremely beneficial in, in different ways. No? All right. All right. Thank you. Um, Rudy, what do you need? Uh, uh, this. <laughs> um, I, uh, I thrive on sources. And community is source. Uh, I need a constant replenishing of uh, books and poetry and uh, an e expansion of uh, uh, inspirational uh, faces, ideas. I need more time late at night to listen to Frank Sinatra. I need, uh, I need sources. I think sources for <laughs> inspiration, for will, for encouragement to explore the new. Um, I, that's, that's, that's what I, th I think. That's 
that's what that's what uh, I thrive on. So you know this this opportunity to meet people that I don't know, to meet dancers who I love, and to hear singers who are solving these uh, creative problems. This is community. I think we we need community right now, and not just the communities that we you know have have battened ourselves into, but the larger community out there that reminds us in conversations like this that we're alive. Yeah. So I'm going to hand this back to Janice before I do. I would just say um, for myself, um, I just need artists to, to be artists and to realize that um, it is difficult. You do have to change with the times and um, that's okay. Um, it's also okay to acknowledge what you're not good at. I'm I'm terrible at technology. Just ask anybody that helped put this together. Um, but I know who I can call and ask, and they can help me get that done. Um, and I'm here uh, if you need anything through Artemis Arts, um, working with the women, and also on the board of Artists United. So if I can help you out in some form or fashion, you let me know. Janice, I want to give it back to you. Very well. Cool. Thank you to everyone. Wow, this has just been a delight. This has been lovely. Um, so we're going to wrap up with a couple of things. The first of which is a lightning round. Um, so this is just <laughs> the first thought that comes to your mind. So I will ask each one of you a question. Stephen, oh, what no. book by your bedside? What book are you reading right now? Oh dear! It's nobody's gonna nobody's gonna know who this Nicholas okay. Legat Legat, who was a great innovator in ballet in in Russia, although he wasn't Russian. So many of them uh, were not, but they brought their artistry from other countries to Russia, and Russia picked up on ballet and ran with it. Also, another book, and I can't think of the name of it because look uh -huh. at the color of my hair once again. <laughs> it's, a, it's about the sort of really sort of the bad news about certain very famous authors. <laughs> and I won't go into any detail, but I'm loving I that. I love that. I'm, I'm loving That's, that. Okay, let's hear some dirt on Charles Dickens. Okay. <laughs> He's in there. Um, Jen, Jen. What is the favorite room or part of your house right now? What, where do you go to when you want to feel good? You're on mute, Jen. You're muted. <laughs> uh, the balcony. Balcony? Yeah, if we didn't have like an outdoor space where I could see the water and, and the outdoors and the sunshine, I, it would, things would not be as okay. okay. That's great. Beautiful. Um, Celia. Wait, 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 I have a question for you. Ah, there you go. What do you look at or listen to when you want to shift from the craziness? Is it a work of art, a song, a picture of a, somebody you love? Uh, my cats, <laughs> I, they've made appearances, I'm sorry. Uh, but, There's but, no apology needed. But truly like um, they have a habit of curling up next to me when I'm, when I, when I need them most and I sort of Wow. bury my head in their bellies and that. And you do shit. realize that through this whole thing, you've been a lighting designer, right? Cause you've had this amazing window yeah, this frame terrible. light on you. So really you've got, you've got another my career. My window is, I face West, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Rudy, and I, I saved this question specifically for you because of what you just said. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, oh yes, actually something you said earlier. Zoom or phone, if you want to get real with somebody, Zoom or phone. Oh. oh. Uh, think about it yeah i have to say because um this happened recently and i realized that there is something about zoom that is really seductive mm -hmm. and, and, by, and by that i mean it, it 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 can permit a certain intimacy but there's also seemingly enough of a wall Yep. that you feel as if uh, you're, you're somehow protected. And so I find that Zoom calls, especially those that are very personal or with some of the writers I work with who just love to let you know, their imaginations mm -hmm. go, that they, they, become, they become intensely personal and there are revelations that I, I don't believe they would have made on a phone call because that 
feels to this. Mm. And then I hear things. I've heard my friends say things in the last several weeks and more and more so. I loved my, my mother, but I hated my father or the opposite. I loved my father, even though my father was a friend of mine said, I, my father was very brutal to me and I came to love him and I could never love my mother because she tolerated it. And I thought, wow. Heavy and stuff. that came out, that came out in a Zoom? Came out, we have been friends for 20 years. I never mm. knew this, I never heard this. And we had such an intensely intimate conversation. I think the distance of it allowed him to be revealing and yet still be intimate. And I see that wow. more and more that, now you can't have a steady diet of that because that's the richest <laughs> of meals right. that there is. And you have to, you know, in some ways not get seduced entirely right. into, you know, into that. But I think, you know, that I would say. I would that's say, beautiful. Yeah. That's really beautiful. And actually I had a similar conversation with a friend yesterday where we got it, we, yes, so I completely- you places that you never imagined that you- Yes, got. we covered topics that I had never imagined. Yeah. Um, so at the, at the top of this, one of my jobs was to state Artists United's mission, which I did not do. But I think actually for anybody who has witnessed this and, and attended this panel, and I gotta say thank you to all the viewers who have attended this panel, um, I think you're seeing Artists United's mission here, displayed right here and now. But to be formal, Artists United is an international advocacy organization with a mission of helping artists connect with each other, to ask for help, to offer help, to work in reciprocity, to get art made faster and easier. Um, I'm so happy to have been a part of this. I have so enjoyed speaking with all of you and listening to all of you. This has been utterly charming. So thank you all for participating. Um, and uh, I would like to say that we have another panel coming up on May 7th. It's an industry panel, Innovating Art During Disruption. Um. And it's a panel discussion exploring the impact of COVID-19 on artists and how they're adapting. So akin akin to this conversation, please join us live on YouTube, May 7th at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Um, thanks again to everyone. And I just wanna, I'm looking at my list. Yes, thank you. Check out the network. Check out artistsunited.net. Um, if you have received a stimulus check and if you are out there, anybody out there who's listening to this, and there's a piece of your stimulus check that you're not using, please feel free to donate to Artists United. We greatly appreciate it. We are a 501c3, so it's tax deductible. Um, thank you again to everyone. Thank you to the dynamic duo behind the scenes, Catherine Ingram and Jennifer Wallace. Jennifer Wallace is our board chair. Catherine Ingram is also on the board and she's been our tech master. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to Sam Hull. You are a charming devil. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to our panelists. You've all been delightful. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.